guys, what's up? Um, in case you didn't get that, that was um, Without Me by Eminem. And I really just wanted to say, guess who's back? Once again, the Carrot Man back on the iMac, um, coming at you with a new series. And this one's called Study and Grind. And the important part of this one, well, both are important, but what you probably really want to see is this part here, Grind, because I've not been able to do it for ages now. Um, but now I'm grinding again, I'm back home, and I'm sort of like working on my game. Taking it really seriously over the summer, I don't know what my overall life plan is. As always, I tend to plan ahead very little in life and sort of drift between um, poker and other pursuits. Um, some of them work, some of them not. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be playing for the foreseeable future all the time, hopefully, and also making videos as such. Uh, the idea here is that because I'm taking poker a lot more seriously these days, um, it's not just going to be jumping into like four tables and talking about whatever happens. First, I'm going to be getting us into the mood and warming us up. I talked a lot in Common Pitfalls, my last major series about warming up and being in the right frame of mind for your session, both from a mental point, ga mental game point of view, where you're like in the right objective frame of mind, not to get tilted or not to get phased if things don't go well at first. And also so you're in a sort of studious frame of mind where you're ready to sort of go forward and think about things really analytically and logically. So studying before you play is definitely like a really important thing for you to do. And I'm going to show you today the way in which I study before I play and the kind of work that I've been doing on my game on a general basis. And then I'm going to get into the action and fire up four tables of 100 NL and do a bit of grinding and sort of explain my thoughts as usual for you guys and hopefully update you as to what's changed in my game and how, I've, how I'm trying to develop my game. I just realised that I omitted the carrot man's beard on this, in the second, um, the second picture here. I've not got rid of my goatee in real life. It's just that I forgot to put it in. But yeah, the idea here is that we're looking at ranges a lot when we study. That's why I've got this sort of poker stove-esque um, range chart here and the carrot man's like studiously looking at it with his pen or pencil or whatever that is and his little notepad furiously jotting down notes and I'm going to show you how I actually do that. I don't do it with a, a literal paper physical notepad. I do it online using a Microsoft Word application called Notebook or something like that. So I'll show you how that works and how I'm organizing my poker learning quest in a minute. Um, then down below you can see that the carrot man's gone from this bright looking sort of enthusiastic geeky student He's taken the glasses off and he's gone into full black-eyed carrot man grind mode where he's trying to own fish with his ace, ace of spades through your diamonds here and his multicoloured poker chips and his Nike trainers. You'll notice that the shoes of the classroom have been replaced by the track shoes of the actual battle. So, and there's the fish, the common opponent that we try and, that we, that we strive to play against more than anyone else. So, this series is exciting. I don't know how many episodes it's going to be, I'm just going to keep making some episodes of it, if it goes well, if you guys like it, and see how we go, there's not like a theme, I'm so relieved I don't have to make like powerpoints, because they're just really tedious after a while, constructing powerpoint after powerpoint, rather I get to draw and make use of this lovely iMac paint facility, and then, yeah, do everything back to full capacity, it's very nice, so, let's get into this video now, let me show you what I do to study, and I'm going to start by showing you guys a hand that I played rather recently, I think it was yesterday, in fact. Um, and the way I've been doing this is I've been marking and tagging an absolute shitload of hands <clears throat> during my sessions. And this is really, really important because reviewing, as I always say, and you're probably sick of me preaching about it by now, um, but reviewing is like the most important thing that you can do. If you're reviewing all the interesting spots that come up, all the spots where your decision is an automatic, or even... A spot where your decision is automatic, but with other parts of your range it wouldn't be, and therefore you want to learn how you should play your range in that spot, then you should tag it and you should look at it after the session or the next day, sometime relatively soon after when it's still quite fresh in your head. This is pretty important. Um, so I've been doing this a lot, and then after the session or the next day or whenever, I've been looking at the hand, but I've not just been looking at the hand in isolation, I've been using the hand as a token of the kind of spot that it is. It's simply one instance of the kind of spot that it is. So you'll see here in this hand, this is just an example of one kind of situation. What I'm really interested in 
is yes, firstly, just looking at the hand and see if I made any mistakes and see if I like how I played it in isolation. But then secondly, what I'm wanting to do is look at the spot and think about it in terms of how I'm going to play my whole range there. And actually, if it's a very common spot, which this one is, and most of these hands I do this with are common spots, I want to look into what's my strategy in that spot? What range am I going to do certain things with against the average population? And by average population, I mean the average reg that I don't know too many specific things about. Because the most common person you will battle at 100 NL, no matter how well you table select, is an average fairly competent regular these days. That's just the way it goes. So I'm not really so intrigued to find out. I need to pause this video because I think my girlfriend's locked my sister out of the flat that we all live in and I need to let her in. So bear with me. Okay, sorry about the slight disruption. Um, so yeah, basically I want to look at these spots in terms of what they mean for my whole strategy. What should I be doing? What different ranges should I use for different actions in these spots? Um, I might do this maybe two or three times during a review when I look at a lot of hands. Some hands I won't actually do this with. I will just look at the spot in isolation. If it's a more specific thing that doesn't come up all the time, then I'm not so interested in understanding exactly how I'm going to play everything in that spot. I'm more interested in just looking at my line and practicing my ranging abilities and practicing my thought process overall. But when it's really common like this, I for sure I'm going to have a look at it and dissect the strategy in that spot and I'll show you guys the note document I use to do that in just a minute. But first of all, let's have a look at this hand and just get into the review of it basically. I'll show you guys what I mean. So this is a blind versus blind situation. It's kind of funny actually because I don't really have this this hand in my opening range against a regular but I don't think I knew very much about this guy at the time. Oh no I did. I'd just seen him get in king-queen pre-flop against this guy and get stacked. Um, I had like the semi-read that he's like an aggressive regular. As such, I don't like my open here of ace-2 offsuit out of position. I think this should be a fault. So here's like a hand-specific thing that I just don't like at all. My opening range I've devised from a small blind against regs and aggro regs and it's definitely tighter than to include a hand of this kind of weakness. So I don't want to open this hand in general here. But that said, it's not going to be a huge mistake or anything. It's just a slight slip in terms of my general strategy as played. Um, I open and get called and the flop comes down. 6-7 deuce. And I've taken this flop as my trademark flop to represent a blind versus blind spot where I have the initiative, I'm the pre-flop raiser, and the flop is fairly low, not too coordinated and dry but not paired. So this is a very sort of set situation that's going to come up loads. There'll be loads of times where you open blind versus blind against a reg and you get a flop like this. And instead of just taking every single one of these as you go and saying, okay, what's the best lane for me to take on this flop? I'm going to see bet. Instead, if you actually think about this spot as a whole and think about your strategy here, then you don't even need to do that in the future. You just know you're playing really solidly because you've already devised a cool strategy for this situation. So, so yeah, I'm pretty happy with this new way of looking at things. And on this flop, um, I've decided to look at my, at my range for what I'm going to do. I decided to check here and at the time, and at the time I played this hand, I hadn't yet thought how, about how I was going to play my range. I hadn't taken a note of my strategy in this situation, so I wasn't entirely sure how I would play everything here, because I haven't looked at it yet. But that said, I've got some ideas about this flop. Firstly, um, this is a board that misses my range pretty damn frequently, and misses my opponent's range really often as well. What does that mean? Well, it depends who has the widest range to start with, and I think that my range here is actually stronger than my opponent's range because I'm out of position. I need to be careful about what I'm opening here, whereas he's in position and can flat me pretty much at will with a really wide range here, assuming that I'm opening quite wide. So generally, I think in these games, with the average population, the caller's range here is going to be a little bit wider and weaker than the opener's range, but that's obviously balanced out by the fact that he has position and I don't. So, <clears throat> in this situation, I decide to check Ace Deuce here. And why should I check Ace Deuce here? Um, I think that it makes sense to be checking a lot of hands on this flop, because um, I want his weak range to stab. If I can get him to like just put a bet in with a really wide weak range that for the most part just misses this, and his range, I'll remind you, is definitely weaker than mine because 
while I have loads of overpairs here, like 9s plus, he probably doesn't have 9s plus, or at least not 10s plus here, because he's got a 3-bet 10s plus blind versus blind, reg versus reg, almost certainly. However, he can definitely have loads of like random broadways here that have just completely whiffed this board. Loads of King Jack, Queen 10, random offsuit combos. You can have like just Ace X that's missed this board. You can have just so much air here. Um, and so if I can get him to put in a bet with his range, then I'm effectively getting him to put in a bet with lots of air. And anytime you can get your opponent to put in a bet with lots of air and you have a stronger range than him, that has to be good. Therefore, I want to check quite a lot here. I've decided that this should be my strategy, and I'll show you the formal written down version of that strategy in just a minute. <clears throat> so, he bets, I have ace-deuce. What kind of line am I taking here when I check? I'm probably taking a check-call line. Um, this can be like a little bit dodgy because it's a really weak hand to check-call, but I think it's fine to check-call a couple of streets here and against a reg here, I'm not just going to check call flop and full turn, so I'm going to get owned doing that. I'm going to be calling turn as well with this hand, because I just beat all his bluffs. Um, what else can I check call here to make this better? If I really want to, I can check call like aces here, if I want to protect this range, but I don't really think I need to, because his range is just so, so weak when he bets here that I'm not bothered about making sure that I'm protecting myself. This is a spot where I think my opponent it's just going to be seriously unbalanced. Like when he bets his flop, he's so unbalanced towards air. He's not flatting too, too much 6x or 7x, although he does have some. But like his range here, just being all big cards and suited cards and aces and things like that, it's just going to whiff so often that I'm kind of comfortable checking down a slightly weaker range. I don't want something like aces in there that's so strong that's going to fall into another part of my range that makes more use of its nuttedness that we're going to see in just a minute. But here, I can check call also with things like 6x and 7x because they block the pairs that he can make here and the pairs on this board are the majority of his value range because he doesn't have very many over pairs here. Most of his value range here is 7x or 6x and because of that I want to check call with a bunch of good showdown value hands like 7x and 6x that also block his sets and his 7x and 6x. Ace deuce here blocks pocket twos, which is kind of nice because that's like part of the range he's going to go to town and fire three and all run outs with. So if I'm planning on calling down, which I probably am against an aggressive regular who's just got loads of air in his range, and I'm definitely going to be calling turn against this guy as well, I may not even have a range to check calls flop and folds turn because I just think he just rarely fires one and gives up because I've already seen him to be kind of aggressive looking. If he's like a more straightforward ABC sort of one and done kind of weak reg, then I'll have a different kind of plan here. But against this guy, I don't really have a plan of calling flop and folding turn too often, if at all. So, I decide to check call here and plan on check calling pretty much all turns. The jack is a fine turn for me, I'm not really bothered by it. Um, it does, I mean, okay, yeah, I'd probably prefer if like a, a random deuce rolled off. Obviously, that'd be nice for me. But in terms of blank turns, this is like fairly blank. Yeah, it does hit some of his. It does hit his range. Like it does hit some of his over cards. But almost every card that comes down here is going to hit his range in some way. Okay, maybe like a four or something is better. It's more of a blank for me, and I can call again. But this is actually a card that he's almost guaranteed to fire with everything, all his bluffs. So he's gonna fire this with like all the over cards that don't contain jacks. And there are a lot more of those than there are ones that do contain jacks. So I decide to check call again here. He makes this really ridiculously big bet size, like kind of polarizing a little bit. Like this did make me kind of want to fold, but then I thought like maybe this is just the standard here. Um, you don't often come again come across guys who are like so unbalanced that they bet really big with the nuts and then bet smaller with bluffs here. So I decided just to stick with my plan and call again. Um, and I was planning on calling down on pretty much any river that wasn't like horrible. Club rivers are not so great here because you can have back their flush draws that have decided to bet the turn. But that said, I might just call down again on a club river anyway, I don't know. But certainly on blanks here, I think I'm going to call again. I just expect guys to fire three of this really often because like, like what does he have when he fires three? He's not going to be good enough, I don't think. He's not going to know what I'm doing well enough to fire three with like pocket eights here or seven x or six x. So it really polarizes his range to jack x or like sets or like random two pair or something nutted like that or air basically. 
on this river it's not so good because 4-5 gets there, you can have 4-5 suited in his range for sure, I can't. Um, and flushes get there, you can have back throw clubs. So on this river it's a bit closer, I might fold, I don't know. It's not the river I wanted to see. As played I didn't need to make that decision because he gave up and I won the hand, which was fine. So in general I think this is an okay way to play Ace Deuce here. As long as I it's not like the top of my check call range, that would be kind of horrible. So the question is, what else am I going to check call here? Um, I'm going to check call 6x and 7x because they just block his value like really well and block his sets as well. It's just awesome. Um, those are like the best hands for me to check call. I'd much rather check call those than I would something like 8s or 9s or 10s. And the reason is that 8s or 9s or 10s are, for one, stronger hands that can extract three streaks of value from 6x and 7x exactly. And two, they're more vulnerable hands in a sense well, they're a little bit more vulnerable in that they don't have as many outs when behind and bad turn cards, so kind of meh. But the other thing is that they don't block his 6x or 7x at all. Um, and so I want to bet because he has those hands more often. And if he has 6x or 7x when I have 8s, I just want to bet 3 streaks. If he has 6x or 7x when I have 6x or 7x, that's just less likely to happen. Um, and sometimes I'll be losing and things, so it's not as clear that I can just bet 3 streaks of value. So... I want to bluff catch the times I block his value range, and I want to bet against his value range the times I beat it and don't block it. Okay? So, our plan is beginning to form here. We have a check call range. We have some idea of a betting range. What else do we want to bet? We want to bet like 8s, 9s, 10s, like I said, but we also want to bet some air, like some, some sort of C bet bluffs. What about like the times we just have? So sort of jack ten of clubs here. We definitely want to bet. We have a back their flush draw and two overs. We don't want to like check fold here. And we've already established our opponent has a really weak range. Um, so we want to be c betting that. So from c betting that, we want to be c betting some hands as well. And I've chosen um, eights through the jacks here to c bet for value. I'm going to show you guys the written version of this in just a second when we recap the plan. Okay. So I'm going to c bet some air. I'm going to c bet some over pairs. I have not talked about queens through aces. What am I going to do with them? I could bet them. I could check call them if I thought it necessary to strengthen my check call range. Here I don't because, like I say, when my opponent bets here, he's so unbalanced towards overcards and air that I'm not bothered that my flop calling range is weak. Remember, although the board is going to run out and start looking a little bit uncomfortable for us, um, his range is going to be like so weak, and most of the time on the turn when an overcard comes, he won't have hit it it will be one of the ones he doesn't have because there are lots of overcards here to this board. Most of the time, he's not hit this jack, although sometimes he has. And we can get better turns as well, like random seven, sixes, deuces that we can just continue to call down on and be happy about, as long as we think he's aggro enough to bet them. Okay, so... So we've got some other hands left here that we've not really talked about. First of all, in our check call range, um, we can also probably put things like suited broadways with lots of showdown value that have back their flush draws. So things like ace king, ace queen, ace jack of diamonds, ace ten of diamonds, ace king, ace queen, ace jack of clubs and of hearts. These kind of hands we can check call because they just play really well in lots of turns and they're just as good a bluff catcher here as like deuce x or sex x is to some extent. Um, and yeah, we can get to showdown with them and win and he will barrel the times we smash the turn. I'd rather have like, I'd probably rather have like ace king of diamonds here than I would ace deuce off, just because although it's slightly weaker relative hand strength wise, um, it's far more playable because we've got these two over cards that he can now, he can now fire at us. And he will be firing kings like all the time here. And sometimes we'll even completely dominate him. When he has king queen and we have ace king here, we check back. Um, and then a king comes on the turn. That's going to speak for us because he's just going to like, oh, if we check call flop, sorry, then King comes in a turn, he's going to barrel that like all day long when he's got it, when he doesn't, when he has it, we can do all kinds of things. We can even raise turn for value or whatnot. And when he doesn't, we just, you know, we just pick up extra money because he's always firing it as a bluff. So happy days. So my other range here, I said before that I want to be checking this spot a hell of a lot. And the reason for that is that I want him to put lots of money in with a weak range. And the best way I get him to do that is by checking and letting him bet. And then I'm going to have some kind of balance range or balance-ish range to exploit that and take advantage of that. So 
what I want to do here is have a check raise bluffing range as well. And the hands I'm going to use for that are the times I have like the backdoor draws or gut shots or overs or whatever, backdoor straight draw, backdoor flush draw, that kind of thing. And I actually have not so much showdown value. So when I don't have like nut ace highs and stuff. So maybe if I have like king queen of diamonds, king queen of hearts, king jack of clubs, these kind of hands are going to be check raise bluffs in my range. And I'm going to balance those by check raising for value all my two pair sets and queens plus combos. So let me show you what all of that looks like. I've explained the rationale behind it. Now let me show you how I go about trying to trying to study these kind of spots and decide what my ranges are. This is what I use for it. So if I double tap, we'll go to this window. Um, Macs are really awesome for this kind of thing, by the way, when you've got like different windows going at the same time, you don't have to mess around opening and closing them. You just double tap into into your like dashboard thing or whatever, and it brings up like all the windows you've got open. You can just select. I love my iMac. So good to be reunited with it. Or with him. His name is I Boris. So it's definitely a boy. All right. So here we have my document, my note document. One of them. This is the one for strategy. I've got another one just for general observations, things I've I've found about the population. And for just random hands that are too rare to fit into like a paradigm that I want to make like an absolute strategy for, where I want to like decide all my ranges for and stuff like that. Sometimes a spot is just unique and you should just not waste time doing this with it. However, this is gonna happen loads, there'll be loads of times when I raise and get into a a spot blind versus blind with a reg where I'm the aggressor and the board is low and dry. That's gonna happen shitloads. So I've made a plan for it. So th this is just my notes here, and um, this flop misses villain's range fairly drastically. Therefore, check call, check raise here must be pretty nice with a good part of our range. I just write this stuff out to remind myself. I review this like fairly regularly so I don't forget like what my ideas are in all these different spots. And it's just really nice. It's just better than being blind in a spot and just having to come up with a fresh decision every single time because you've not taken the time to think about how you should play generally in a spot. When you take the time to do this, it suddenly all falls into place. You don't really need to worry anymore about coming up with the best plan in the moment, you, especially if you're playing like six or eight tables or ten tables or something and you don't have time. This kind of method of sort of learning a strategy that you think is good and then sticking to it is awesome. You can deviate as well. If, you, if I learn that my opponent's actually really passive and is going to check back lots, then cool, I just get rid of all my checking ranges and I just start c-betting everything instead. Um, you know, I can adjust this. I can change it based on what who I think my opponents are and how they're playing. Anyway, let's go on. So our check raise range can go like this. Cosy is like an Italian word that means like so or in this way and it's much nicer than saying like this, I think. So I kinda just use it to be to be that douchebag guy that went away to Italy and came back and started using Italian words in English sentences. Just to be that moron. Um so value, we have sets, we have queens to aces, we have two pair. Then we have bluffs, we have weaker overs that don't have so much showdown value with backdoors, gutters, open end straight draws, that kind of thing. So our betting range here, that's our check raise range, like we said, and it makes a lot of sense, I think. Makes us nice and balanced, and when he has air, we get this extra bet from his air that's pretty cool. If he's just folding the flop to a C-bet with a decent chunk of air here, which he should be because his range is weak and he can't afford to just flow everything because that's really bad, um, then we don't really make any extra money, we just pick up the pot, which is fine, but there are, we want some of the time to be able to extract extra from him, that's why we check raise this kind of range, and we protect the bluffs with the value, we protect the value with the bluffs, so we're balanced. Um, so yeah, onto our betting range, value 8-8 eight, eight to Jack-Jack. Now you might wonder, um, why have I chosen those hands to bet and not to check raise or check call? The reason is that these hands are way more vulnerable than Queen Queen to Ace Ace. While I can check raise Queen Queen to Ace Ace, they're also just stronger, the latter, which is important too. Um, but Villain probably doesn't have too much 10 10 Jack Jack here, like, you know, he's 3 betting those pre, so these hands are not a million miles apart, like from a, a relative hand strength point of view here, even though they are from an absolute point of view. But the thing is that I want to protect 8 8 and Jack Jack a little bit here because. When he has two over cards and the flop checks through, he can bink one that now beats us and then costs us a bunch of money. And that's not good. That's why I want to bet those hands and make him fold over cards when we have eights to jacks. Because it sucks for us when we check and he checks back like ace ten and then like binks the ace on the turn and we're just kinda like, ah, 
could have seen by the flop and made him fold that. So I want a betting range in the flop. I want it to have some value hands in it, obviously. So I've chosen these ones as the most appropriate ones. And like I said earlier, I've chosen 7x and 6x for the check call bluff catching range because they block loads of his value combos. Whereas these ones, 8-8 the jacks, they block a few. They block when I have 8s or 9s. I block 8s or 9s, otherwise I don't block too much because he's 3-betting the rest anyway probably and he might even 3-bet 8s or 9s here and just shove over 4-bets, that's really feasible and common kind of strategy at 100 no limit these days. So hopefully I'm not losing you with all this rambling, but yeah, that's why I've chosen those hands as my value range, they're a bit more, or my betting value range, they're a bit more vulnerable, I don't really want to see a turn when he just has a hand that's folding anyway, um, I don't want to risk him like checking back and beating me on the turn or even like if I check all these hands and then the turns like a big card it's kind of like meh because I yeah I just don't like it so much so villain 7x 6x X is unblocked so we target that for townage purposes for by townage I mean value towning so because we don't block a 7 king 7 suited 6 8 suited all the zillion combos of these you can flat with blind versus blind it's better because these are the hands I'm going for three streets against, so I can just fire three streets here comfortably with ace two jacks, knowing that those hands are more abundant due to the fact that my hand doesn't block them at all. Um, then I've got bluffs that I'm going to just bet. Um, plenty of air, like I said at the start, when my range is stronger than my opponent's, and when my opponent just has loads of air because his range misses a board really badly, like this one, then I just want to be c-betting a bunch of my air. I don't want to be check-folding anything because there's just no need to be check folding anything here when you can construct the strategy like this instead, in my opinion. So our check call range here is, like we said, the hands with showdown value, good showdown value that I'll add as well, 7x and 6x here are relatively very strong hands, blind versus blind, where ranges are wide on this kind of texture, um, and it's very dry as well, so they are strong. And our, we check call these hands because they block villain's value range, it makes it even more likely the villain has a bluff when he bets his flop. So that's why I've chosen those to check call with. Then we have good showdown value overs, like I talked about before, especially with backdoors, ace king, ace queen, that kind of thing. Probably check calling those. Definitely, definitely never folding those on the flop, that's for sure. Um, and then we have like 2x and 4s through 5s, which is just like the, the weakest, probably the most uncomfortable part of our check call range, but I think it should be in there None, nonetheless. 2x has like 5 outs against better hands and is beating like all his air. It might get a bit tricky on later streets, but I think if we call two streets there and then soul read rivers will be fine. Um, so our range is stronger than villains here, so not check folding at all is pretty nice. I don't think we need to check fold at all. Um, my provisional plan going forward here, just when I revise this, I can see that I'm going to revise my check call range if it becomes difficult to play. So if I find that people are really balanced and playing really well against check calling like 2x here, then I might just make that C bet instead, turn it into a C bet bluff or even a check raise bluff, depending, probably a c-bet bluff, um, and then, you know, have a slightly stronger check call range, or leave it in there and add, like, aces in there as well. If I had to choose between queens, kings, and aces, I had to pick one to put in my check call range here, instead of my check raise range, I would put aces in there because it's stronger, and it can handle heat on almost any run out, or any run out, basically, I can just call down, um, or even raise at some point if I want. Whereas queens and kings overcards can fall to those. They're better check phrases than they are check calls because, yeah, they're like the same absolute and relative hand strength as ace ace here against his range because he doesn't have any of those because he has to three bet them in order to not play like a psycho pre flop. So basically, aces would go in there to protect that check call range. But as, as it is right now, I don't feel it's necessary. But you know, I can, I'm open to revising that if I find out that I need to be a bit more sensible in this spot and not check call such a weak range, even though, like I said before, I don't think it's super weak to check call this range just because my opponent's range is so weak as well, so that drags the bar down for what actually constitutes a strong hand in this spot per se. Okay, um, so this is my, I've gone over that hand, beaten it to death, that's how I've made a strategy in this spot, that's how I'm going to play my ranges, my aim is to, not doing it all at once, but just gradually build up a repertoire of lines I'm really familiar with for lots of different situations, drum them into my mind and then just be playing a really really solid strategy against all regulars and just my ranges are just sorted like they're a nice launchpad base sort of um, 
to jump off of in one way or another when we learn more about our opponents and we decide that obviously I don't do any of this against fish against like nits or totally random players this is against the average population of regs but when I learn stuff about each of those as individuals um, I can jump off in one way or another start to exploit more and make my ranges less balanced these ranges are not like perfectly balanced or anything but they are like they do have some balance about them but when I learn what my opponents are doing wrong or right in different spots, I can move away from there and try to exploit them and win the War of Exploitability instead of sticking so rigidly to this stuff. But this stuff is good because it's still exploitative. It's like exploiting a situation or exploiting what the average regs range looks like in a certain spot, basically. And they're just so hideously unbalanced in these spots, they just don't know that they shouldn't just bet absolutely everything when I check to them. Do you know why? Because so many regulars in these games just check fold this flop all the time, that 7-6-2 flop all the time. And then, you know, regs can just stab at it and take it down. It's just horrible because all you need to do is like balance your checking range a little bit and then you just can start owning here. So it is exploiting, but it's exploiting with your range against common principles of population reads, not exploiting on an individual basis. But when I want to, when I learn more and I have individual reads, then I can start exploiting on an individual basis instead. Okay, so this is a Word Word document. It's one of the templates that you get in Word notebook layout, it's called. It's really nice. Um, so you've got like three betting here. You've got these tabs down the side, color coded. You know how I love my color codes. For some reason, there's only a few different color codes, which is which sucks. You should be able to customize. Maybe you can, I've not discovered yet. Um, so I've got like four betting. I've got strategies in different spots here. Um, I've got playing the flop without initiative out of position, I've got blind versus blind in position, I've got blind versus blind out of position, different textures. Oh, and what I need to do that I've not done yet is get the weak tight link. Basically just shove this hand into weak tight, which is just a site that allows you to convert a hand into a nice legible way where you can share it and also just look at it whenever you want. Um, so I post a hand in weak tight and just take the URL, link it here. I'll do that after the video. Um, and then I can click the example hand, the template hand that's sort of exemplifying the kind of situation I'm on about. And I can see how I played a certain hand in that spot and I can use that as my sort of, my material to exemplify what this strategy is all about. Okay, so I've shown you um, that hand and how I would analyze it. I've shown you the deeper sort of range construction that I've, that I've taken from that hand and then made. And I've shown you like my method of doing it. So. This is the study part of the of the whole thing. Sometimes my mouse like doesn't respond well to my fingers. I think they're like too big or something. Um, so we've done the study. We've made our ranges. We've painted a beautiful uh, masterpiece here. Imagine this was actually a painting like done in like the 14th century. How incredible would that be if that existed and it was just poker so, um Yeah, probably doesn't. So we've done this part and we're going to move on now to the grind. Study and grind. It's a very simple series. Every episode is basically going to be the same, but hopefully you guys love it and that will be okay. If you have any improvements, suggestions, please let me know. Okay, I'm going to pause now so I can set up some tables and then grind for another half hour and this will be like an hour long, but that's cool. Um, so bear with me and I'll just get set, I'll just get set up and then we'll begin the grind section. Hey guys, I'm back with part two. It's unfortunately not the part two that I first planned to show you because the recorder decided to delete half of the, well, the second half of the video basically after I'd paused and resumed. I'm not really sure what went on. It was a bit of a shame because we had a few really fun situations. Nothing that was like so good that I wanted to do a review instead because there were only like a few hands that were that were really fun and a lot of the session I look back on it was just like sort of mundane. Apart from that apart from a few exciting hands, but nevertheless it was quite an exciting like live play in a few places, so but oh well, hopefully this one will be even better. So I've got four tables of one hundred no limit on stars, just like old times. But with my new my new sort of beige and blue theme rock in here, quite liking it. And yeah, we're just gonna in the second part of this, we're just going to play some poker, fresh from the the practice that we've just been doing. And like I said in the last the last series, it is really important that we can do some kind of warm up, something to get ourselves into the right frame of mind 
for for grinding if you just sit down then a you've not really mentally prepared yourself emotionally you've not gone into that objective analytical frame of mind and b you're just going to be a little bit rusty you may as well like oil up your poker thought process before you actually start playing for money it makes sense to just to spend like five or ten minutes which is why we're doing things in this order study then play rather than play then study and as well i think another good pointer is that when you do a session review that you don't do it right after having played like an hour and a half, two hour session. Instead, I think it's better to take a little break, like half an hour and then look at it, or even like sleep on it and look at it the next day, as long as it's like relatively soon after. Um, it'll be really beneficial, but you don't want to do it when your head's completely melted. 9-7 off is like really close, it's kind of like on the borderline of whether I'm min open or not. Um, some guys are going to be min opening like 100 or close to 100% from the button. I don't believe that's the best way to go these days because you're just going to end up folding such an enormous percentage of your range to a 3-bet if you choose to play like that. And yeah, you can you can fold a lot to a 3-bet when you mid-open. You're not risking like so much. It's not such a big deal, but it does give your opponents license to just 3-bet a lot. And people do 3-bet a lot, especially from the small blind these days. So I think like folding the worst of your range, maybe I open about, I've not actually looked into what exactly my button min opening range is, that's definitely one of the next areas I'm going to look at in the planning phase that you saw before, the sort of strategizing phase, but I think it's somewhere around sort of 40, 50% of hands, obviously it changes a lot depending on who's in the blinds. Here we've got two regulars, one of whom looks to be a little bit on the sort of rubbish side of regular, he's like 26, 20, some kind of lag, but like a kind of passive lag with like the large gap between the VPIP and the PFR, and then just generally only a 6% C-bet, uh, 3-bet stat, it doesn't look too active. This is a spot where my range just wants to bet really small. Um, my cutoff range here is fairly weak, it has a lot of aces that aren't very good aces, and hence, even if we're heads up here, we just want to be betting really small to try and get some value. And our C-bets, that's to say the air part of our range doesn't want to be betting big either because that's trying to get folds. So there's not really any reason to bet big here when we've got such a such a weak range on a dry board. Um, we just want to give ourselves the best price on a C-bet and like I say it works out quite well for our actual top pair kind of stuff as well because that's not super strong here. Um, with Ace-Deuce here we can just flat this hand. It's not in my 4-bet range because my 4-bet range consists of mostly weaker stuff that I can't just go ahead and flat. Um, stuff like a6, a7 suited I take to be less playable. That's in there a lot of suited king x and I've got like some offsuit combos as well. So I've got a defined, we're just going to fold here in the bottom right because yeah we have king high and he's called the flop 3 way. It's not a bad spot for a villain to actually go ahead and just float. Like I think it's fine but he's getting like a great price or getting getting 3 to 1 on the flop to put in a little float here we should be playing quite honestly but honestly I just don't think the population is playing that way don't think we're getting floated all that much table 2 villain checks his turn we obviously have to bet here to build the pot of it I'm not going to bet too big I don't need to he's already built the pot a lot for me on the flop he didn't really need to make it that size if I go 16 here then there's going to be, I'm going to be on 60 with sort of 32, there'll be like over 70 in there. Yeah, I'm going to bet like 1750, you're going to bet pretty small here. With the hope of like inducing from, I don't know what, with like some kind of Jack 10 nonsense or something like that here would be nice. He's probably check calling like East Queen here, King X, and then just check folding air anyway, so. Not too much we can do to get value against the air part of his range there, I don't think. With the jacks, um, you can definitely make an argument for like check folding that flop, but I thought I'd just fire one here. Um, so when your opponent is calling like really wide, as appears to be the case here with this fish, usually our c bet's going to be fairly successful. He also looks to be on the aggro side of fish, so I don't really want to just check fold. A pair of jacks here that's going to be the best hand a bunch if he's going to fold for a lot of my c-bets. This is an interesting spot and one where usually people aren't bluffing here, which means two things. It means one, we don't want a 4-bet range, 
because it just looks like so super nutted. But at the same time, if people aren't bluffing, then we do want a 4-bit range because they're not folding anything. So it's kind of like a weird catch-22 situation. It depends on whether this guy is the kind of player who can actually bluff middle position versus under the gun. If he is, this 4-bit is going to have a shitload of fold equity. If not, and I'm going to guess not because he's only got a 6% 3-bit here, could be outdated, but his 3-bit's very small. Um, and if that's in total, then it should be even less middle position against under the gun. But obviously he folds there, so I take that to mean that he's not like folding East King to the 4-bit, because that would just be weird. I think he's just likely got a 3-bit bluffing range there. So that's definitely something that I need to note. Because yeah, I'd say that a lot of people don't. Even today when the games are more aggro, I mean most regs probably do, but there are still a lot of regs that don't. And when a guy's got 6% 3 bets, that I kind of assume that if his game hasn't changed, obviously it probably has, um, then he just has a hand there. A lot of the time, therefore, it becomes really, really important that I don't waste an opportunity to 4 bet and get it all in pre flop when I have aces. If I had like kings or something like that, it's not quite as important because I'm not crushing his range anywhere near so severely and I could just flat there in case he's got a bunch of bluffs because 4-betting looks really strong. But with aces, um, my opponent's range is just going to be like so so strong usually if he is a, a pure 6% 3-better, obviously he's not. But if he is, if that's, that's accurate, then you know I cannot possibly miss the opportunity to just get it in against the likes of ace-king and that sort of thing. I should maybe stop timing down before making the desperation C bet. I don't know if that looks weak or strong, but it certainly looks odd. Um, you get floated quite a lot these days. That's like one thing I've begun to realize recently. On table two, I'm going to check to raise this flop. My plan on this kind of flop for my range, I'm going to just give up on on table three here against this guy. There's not really a whole lot I can do with absolutely no equity here. Um, with the against the squeeze here, we kind of just have to fold, unfortunately. I don't make my check raises too big on this kind of texture. Like, draws are a relatively small part of his range, I'm not too worried about that. He has a lot of just random worse queen x, and because my value range is like not super strong here, it contains probably queen jack and above or something like that. Um, I'm playing a sort of strategy here whereby raising kind of small, I firstly give my bluffs a good price, and I'm going to have a fair whack of bluffs here because I'm playing this way with my better queen x. And people just tend to not believe you when you check raise these kind of flops. And again, I don't need to bet like too big on the turn, but it's definitely like I'm going to go for three streets here with king queen for sure. <clears throat> check calling blank rivers is also an option, but on this seven, I don't really love it because some of his range just improves there. That river really sucks for us. Um, I don't want to turn my hand into a bluff though, I think it's still a fairly easy play to just check fold here because I think his worst queen x just probably gives up at this point, doesn't turn itself into a bluff or anything like that. Um, with jacks I can bet small or I can check back and try to induce, I'm just going to bet small and start building like that. So when he bets this river, um, like either he's turning some kind of hand into a bluff here like pocket tens or queen x. Which I don't think is super likely, but it's also a river that he should expect me to bluff very often if I have air. So maybe my range is a little bit face up here as well. That said, I'm going to have aces that can check this river and things like that. I don't think I need to be calling with king-queen here. Um, so I think we have to fold here. It's just, there's no reason to think that, that our opponent is turning queen x into a bluff there. And... Yeah, you might be doing it with a worse pair or something like that, but I don't think it's something we should really assume until we've got a better idea about how he's playing. Very standard with jacks, don't even think I need to talk about that. Um, we get small raised on the flop. We just call, obviously, we don't need to stick it in there because we want our opponent. We're going to stack it as king x anyway. We don't need to raise, there's no urgency, the board's dry. We just want him to basically hang himself on the turn the times that he has there. He's a random fish, he could just show up with like pocket fives there and just end up shoveling it all into the turn, so it's very important that we give him the reason to do that. I think that's quite straightforward though, and we should all have a decent grasp on, on that kind of... It's not even really a slow play, it's just the, the obvious way to play the hand. So, yeah, my, my range here is definitely wider than most regs for raising this flop for value, 
And but that's good because it allows me to balance my draws and bluffs a lot. And I feel like I get called down here loads. It's just that river is really terrible on any other river. I just value bet. And like yes, he can have like aces, kings, ace, queen, and seven x. But most of his range there when he opens. And the cutoff is going to be like random suited queen x down to like queen nine, then worse queens and stuff like that. I might even get looked up by a hand like a pocket pair or whatever. Um, against this fish, I assume he's a fish. Um, I could three bet here. I want a three bet bluff range. He has folded into one three bet already. Um, my hand doesn't play super well with these stack sizes. I can make my three bet a bit smaller though with these stacks. I think I can three bet this hand. It's not really good enough for me to call. I expect my C bet should have a decent amount of fold equity here, I would hope. Especially on a board like that, that's like one of the better flops for my range. The wider the person's calling range, obviously, and um, the wider villain's calling your three bet, the more fold equity you're going to have there with your with your C bets post flop. Um, this is an interesting spot against this guy here. Um, what I usually do here is just check back because I can be giving up this flop a hell of a lot and I want to protect my air. I check back some weak aces here as well and definitely kings like fits into that category. Now it's a straightforward value bet when I've got second pair. Um, he's going to be leading the turn with an ace most of the time. I do want to take a note that he check folded that turn and didn't stab. That's important. With twos I'm going to go ahead and make a flat because um, yeah, I think that I'm not likely to get squeezed here very often. It's far more likely it's just going to go multi-way because I've got this Weak, I mean, he's 13 and 3, okay, he's fairly nitty, but he's some kind of weaker player. And we're a little bit deeper, and I'm in position in the pocket here. So I think set mining's pretty important there. This is the kind of board you can stab at. I just hate having twos. I wish I had, like, ace jack or something. Just something with a bit more equity. Back to a draw, like, twos is just... If I'm, if I'm stabbing twos here, it means I'm stabbing, like, my entire range when it's checked to me here. And that's not, like, necessarily a bad thing in a vacuum. And, like, from an exploitability point of view, if they're both folding enough, then I should just still do it. But I don't know if they are both folding enough. And, therefore, if I don't know how what this check means, it is often a check fold, but not always. And I don't know much about this net behind me. has quite a tight range by the looks of things. Then I should just balance myself a little bit more and not be stabbing absolutely everything. Not be stabbing the hands that have zero equity here. Um, concentrating more on semi-bluffing with, you know, not even strong semi-bluffing hands, but just hands that are doing a little bit better. Okay, so I said I wanted to take... to take a note on that guy who didn't stab the turn against me. King-10 here is normally in my opening range under the gun. This table's I'll do it anyway, this table is fairly reggy, like it's probably a table I would get off of if I wasn't playing a video, making a video right now, but I would generally open most suited broadways under the gun, I think the hands just play well enough, and in these games, from what I've seen so far, people aren't totally going to turn by 3 betting under the gun opens, I think as you move up and play 200, 400, it happens a lot more, but at 100 NL, people are still fairly in line when it comes to playing against under the gun. This is a flop that I can definitely get some folds on when they both just have like little pairs and stuff. I don't really like to get raised here because it's difficult to continue. Um, but they shouldn't have too, too much jack x. It's kind of hard for them to have too much jack x in this kind of situation. I'll fold king 10 here. It's not quite strong enough to cold call on table 1. So I think I should see that it's flop. Um, just because I have like loads of equity here basically. Backdoor draw and the open end straight draw. When I get called in two spots and then turn the nuts or the effective. Um, Oh, sorry, I get called in only one spot. Um, this is a good spot for me. I got a very simple just bet bet here to get it all in. Um, King Jack. If I bet like 12 here, that's 24, 42, yeah. I bet like 13 on the turn. I'll shove River. I want to go a bit bigger just because there's a bunch of draws. You can have the call turn but not River. That's obviously like the worst um, River card I've ever seen. I have to just check back now and lose. It's not really another option. That's unfortunate. Um, yeah. Table 3 I considered a 3-bet there. Jack-9 suited is definitely in my 3-bet range when I can't flat it. And here I definitely can't be flatting it. Because the big blind is just looks like an active regular who's going to squeeze me far too much. Like You do not want to have a flatting range in that spot unless it's like really small and sort of stuff that you can defend or shove over a squeeze or something. Otherwise, you're just burning a bunch of money and you're far better off just widening up your value 3-bet range and then 
as a result of that, you're able to have a lot of bluffs there, and then you can just three bet, um, three bet a linear range that goes down to being somewhat half polarized. I mean, you can mainly a linear range, but you're going to have like a six suited, good suited connectors and stuff like that in there as well. So it's kind of like a hybrid range between being linear and being polarized, and it's a result of the fact that you just can't really flat anything there because you're going to get punished way too bad if you just start calling Jack Nine suited there, and you obviously don't want the full Jack Nine suited there, so you can just three bet it. Hopefully that makes sense. It's again, it's a formulation of work I've done previously, like you saw in the last, the first part of this video where I started formulating a, a range. I made my three bet a little bit bigger on table one just because we are deeper. We're not super deep. I just want to add a dollar to that to make it worse for him to flat me. His implied odds are a little bit better. Um, just ensures that it's a mistake for him to play too loose out of position. I want to make sure that that's, that conditional is in place basically. So yeah, it's a result of work that I've done previously on my game. Um, his 4-bet size here, I'm just figuring out if I can like make a small 5-bet to try to induce anything. I don't think stacks are deep enough. If I 5-bet, I'm basically committing myself, so I think I just ship here, basically, with the ace-king. And then we'll, if he's bluffing here, we'll take a note. And all this note is just to say that he 4-bet, I mean, he may well just have a set 4-bet bluffing range. A lot of people do these days. I do in that spot. I'm not 4-betting like, just if I feel like it. I mean, I will change my strategy if I see that there's something in the dynamic or the game flow that makes me more inclined to, to want to mix something up. Like, for instance, I might see that he's just really, really crazy, and then I'll just take away a bunch of... 4 bet bluffs from my range there, or whatever, and just be 4 bet calling and then tighten up my opening range or whatever, but usually I'll be playing a set sort of strategy, so he may well be doing the same cutoff versus button, or he may be the kind of reg that just likes to get aggressive really early on and just sort of stamp their authority on the spot from the start, and if he's that kind of reg, then I'm taking a note that means that I'm not aware of it yet, but I'm, I've got an idea that that might be the case. And I'm beginning to become aware of it. I'm gonna see bet here because this is the kind of flop where I, can, I my hand is just nowhere near good enough for me to um, fuck. That was like a horrendous misclick, obviously. But fortunately, he folds. Excuse my language. I just like panicked a little bit there because I stuck my stack in with six seven suited. <laughs> um, yeah, six seven suited. I think is like the bottom of my three bit bluffing range there. It's, if not, it's close. Let me check my little card where I've written down my ranges against average, average regs, which this guy is. Um, Ace-Jack, we just call. We want to play a multiple pot with the fish. We don't want the three better. There's no need. Queen-10 is the same idea. We don't really want the three better. We just want to see a flop for cheap. Closing the action is all good. Um, so hijack versus small blind. Bottom of my range. No, it's not actually that wide. The range I've designed here. If I I could three bet a hand like six seven suited, but it involves like opening up my three bet bluff range a lot. So I should only really three bet that hand if I've got reason to think that my opponent's folding more than average to three bets or something like that. Basically, um, this guy leads. I'm just gonna fold queen ten. I mean, he seems like super super straightforward so far. And I don't really see any reason to do anything else. An eight six four, um. Doesn't delayed C bet turn. He's turned with a weak hand. Blah blah blah. Check fold king. Okay, yeah. So this guy seems to be like kind of check foldy. And I might have some barrel opportunities here. So I'm gonna start it by just betting this flop. I do expect to get check called here by like random pairs and ace highs that are better than mine. But I do plan to like fire some more than one barrel at this for sure. So and he I've also got a note that this guy's just folded the flop before, so it could just be that he check folds those kind of flops, and if it is that, and if that is the case, and that certainly seems to be, I want to know about that because that's absolutely huge for me. If he's the kind of guy that check has like much of a check folding range there, then that's cool for me because that board doesn't really hit me so well. It depends what range he's three betting. It doesn't hit him so well either. But generally, these low flops and three bet on th in three bet pots, I think that you can get away with. I'm just going to check fold here with the 7-8, my equity is like just abysmal, and I've seen this guy fold before, I don't really know that he's going anywhere here, I don't have any overcards or anything, so. But yeah, if this guy's just check folding like all his air on that board, that's really really good for me, because C-bets do work relatively frequently with two overcards there, 
especially with back doors and stuff. So if he's checked for me too much, then that's cool. That's why I, another reason why I need to bet there is because I need to find out about that as soon as possible. Cannot flat twos with a reg in the big blind. It's just super spewy. Um, and probably I'm checking back here with the AC six board. By the way, my hand's pretty invulnerable against his range. I don't mind letting a card come off. And with the king ten, I think I just go ahead and. I'm going to go ahead and 3-bet this hand, it's, again, I've not designed an exact range for this spot, but I think that it's a spot where I don't have too much in the way of squeezers behind me. Um, do I want to call or do I want to raise this turn? I'm just going to call, I feel like you can have like better, I mean I could just turn my hand into a bluff there and try and make him fold like queens or something, but I feel like a lot of his range is like better pairs and things like that. Definitely flatting ace-queen suited here, I don't really see in flatting fives, I don't see the reason to... 3-bet that hand, I'm not likely to get top, get called super wide out position there, hijack versus button. Um, let's play this is like a little bit weird. This guy could just be going into like uber slow play mode, he could just be bluffing. Um, I'm getting 3-1, to one. I do expect to lose here more than half the time. I'm going to call just because his line's a bit funky and I expect to win probably more than 25% of the time. Yeah, he's just going over slow play mode, that's what I figured. Um, he's queen here, we're getting a really good price at the back door. I'm going to peel it because our overcards are probably good. And the club is really good for us as well, implied odds wise. Um, on this board, I think I should just bet everything at first just to find out how he's playing here. If I check back with fives, it's very hard for me to get to showdown good. And I think, again, it's a board people just check fold a hell of a lot. And if, he, if I see him not checking anything else, like if I see him, now we fold on the top right obviously, if I see him not protecting that range, like I see this guy like betting all his top pair here or something like that, um, then I can just go to town, like I can just bet every single time he checks those flops and just print money and that's really bad um, on his behalf I think. So I'm just going to take a note, he check folds jack eight seven rainbow blind versus blind, it's not a bad thing in itself, but if you're having to check fold that flop a lot because it's bad for you, you probably need to be checking some other stuff so that you're not just mega exploitable because if he's letting me just stab with my entire range there, I should just call him really wide pre-flop when he opens blind versus blind and then just be stabbing all day. If he's playing that way with his whole range, like just fit or fold, then he's going to get owned there a lot. Um, usually I would 3-bet this hand against a weaker player, but one who opens only 5%, like we just have to call and I'm just going to check fold this flop against him. There's not really too much to be done if his range is super nitty here. I'm going to go for like another sort of 7 minutes, make the video an hour long. Hopefully it won't mess up this time, that would make me happy. Um, with King 9 here, again, like I will give up this flop sometimes. Or is this a flop that's dry enough that I just see better all the time? I think I'm going to see bet small, I mean it's consistent, because if I'm see betting all my air small here, I just have so so much air in my range, that I need to be, I can't just only be see betting aces and better for value, I want like the best nines to be in there as well for sure, um, and then I'm going to check back turn and probably bluff catch this river, although I'm not totally certain about it as play to check back, oh wow, it's very strange, I guess he's going for like river check raise there, Let's take a note of that. Um, goes for river check raise with rivered top two when turn checks through. I can only assume he is. I mean, my range is really capped. No other line makes sense. If he's checking, he wouldn't wouldn't be check calling. So. It's definitely going for a check raise. Do I like his line? Well, I mean, I guess it makes some sense. If I'm checking back the turn with aces, like weak aces, then I'm definitely going to value bet that river with them. Then it makes sense. And probably if I don't have an ace, then I'm not calling the river anyway. Or so he thinks. I probably am because I feel like if he's floating the flop, he's going to bluff that river like always. And he's never going to bet a queen there. He'll just check. Um, yeah, we'll make this call with King Jack. It's a bit speculative, but we have a fish and a big blind. We're not super pumped about playing this hand against red for for a T against his range, but we are very optimistic about playing it against the fish's range. So therefore we definitely want to be calling. Easy call on this flop because we want the fish to come along as well. And yeah, we just don't need to have much of a raising range there. We need the fish to come along. We're happy. We can get check called here by 
um, Queen X, but we have more tens than he does, I would think. And we can have some nuts. I think I'm going to just bluff this turn and bluff River pretty big as well, just to try and get him off a queen. I think most of his range is probably Queen X when he takes this checking the turn line. Um, I mean, it's kind of annoying because he might just like put me on spades all the time here. I don't know, but I feel like I should have some kind of bluffing range here. Um, and I can for sure just have 10x, so I'm just going to go ahead and bet. Does he fold the queen here? Actually, um, I'm just basically repping 10x. I'm going to go ahead and bet and turn the river pretty big. I'm not totally convinced that it's good. I should have a bluffing range there for sure. Because um, I think guys can, can fold a queen. Maybe not ace queen, but can fold a queen when they play that way. But I don't know. It may have been a little bit optimistic to want to go blasting turn and river. Just solely because of the amount of, like, if this board was rainbow, I'd like a hell of a lot more. I'd be much better line because my range doesn't consist of that many bluffs. Because I just don't call, I don't have many flush shots to call, I don't have any flush shots to call the flop with this rainbow. And therefore 10x becomes a much bigger part of my range. But here when he check calls turn, I mean, bleh, he probably just has a queen. Does he fold it? I don't know if he folds it often enough. It's the kind of spot where I feel like people are quite tight in general. They don't expect me to bluff that river. Jack 9 also gets there. It's like a hand that could be in my range. But I don't know. I think my range is too riddled with spades there for me to bluff too frequently there. Um, so yeah, but I do. I don't know. Maybe I don't want to have a bluffer range there at all. I mean, if he never folds a queen, then I don't care about balance. It's just I should play exploitably and only value bet. But if he does fold a queen sometimes, then I definitely want a bluffer range. That's what it comes down to. And he's going to have some weaker queens than, than ace queen. But yeah, it could be bad. Normally I don't open this against a regular. It's just kind of like autopiloting, like old ways of opening any ace. I've decided to have basically shrunk my blind versus blind opening range a good bit. Just so I can better deal with the three betting that goes on. Um, I think I used to open it, open these kind of hands too wide. I'm pretty sure that was one of my, my leaks before. So on this kind of board... Um, We don't necessarily need like a check fold range as we planned earlier, so I think I can just see about this because although it misses my range quite a lot, this is the same kind of board as earlier. It's a little bit worse for me than I think the 7 6 one is, but it also misses my opponent's range quite a bit as well. When he raises here, um, I mean, I guess we just have to fold with these four, that's fine, but I do expect him to have like to be fairly full of shit. Especially when the HUD pops up and I see that he looks to be quite active. But yeah, my range should be like, okay there, I'm not c-betting all of my air. Maybe I do need a check fold range there actually just because, well the thing is I shouldn't be opening this hand in the first place. I think if I stick to my my small blind opening range that I've designed, then my range becomes strong enough there that I don't need to necessarily ever check fold that flop. But when I start opening stuff like that, like I should probably have a check fold range there. I think that's the difference. Um, this is an easy 3-bet with Jack-10. Again, similar reasons. We have a reg here. We don't necessarily want to be... Um, I'm going to go ahead and 3-bet the 7-6 as well. It's kind of borderline. It's towards the bottom of the 3-bet range here, but it should fit with my frequencies quite well to be 3-betting that hand. Um, I, the one thing is that I won't be flatting too many hands there because I have two guys who I know to be very active behind me, but that said, like, this guy seems fairly straightforward so far, so I think I can have a bit more, I can weight my 3 bit range a little bit more towards plus there, and then, and hence I can add a few more combos. Um, okay, so this is an interesting flop spot. I'm going to bet bigger than usual just because the flop's, like, pretty wet. I'm going to bet like half pot there. I'm going to bet a bit bigger just to get a bit more money in in the earlier streets. It works out better for me that way. And then I can look to to get it all in by the river. Um, Not the best card because Ace Jack gets there and it kind of kills my action from other Jacks. But I mean, I bet this I bet this turn with like all my air and stuff. I think when I have two pair, I don't really have any option but to bet turn. And if Villain shows up with like Ace Jack, that's just kind of too bad. And I block the hell out of sets, so he could also flat flop with mm, possibly some. I think I check back river here actually, 
because Villain's Range is not... I don't think he's calling River here with King Jack, Queen Jack. He's definitely playing Ace Jack this way, or any random, like, better hand. Unless I think he's got loads of, like, Ace Queen in his range or something for flatting a flop. I don't think he has too much when he's out of position. If he's in position, this is different, but I think I check back this, this River. Um, just because I don't think he's calling me with a hand like Jack X and he shouldn't have too much Ace X. But I don't know, I mean, it's kind of... It could be that, from a game theory point of view, I probably need to be, like, shoving two pair there in order to have enough value combos for how often I, like, go barrel happy on that board. Um, but I just feel like, in terms of when you think about how the actual population plays that spot, I just think it doesn't call down there very often with Jack X, basically. Um, and... But yeah, maybe I'm being a bit nitty there with two pair, and I probably need to ship that river. Just because I'm good so much, like I don't think Ace Jack is like a tremendously big part of his range, and it doesn't take him to call um, to make a light call there very frequently in order for shipping to become the best line. Like if he only calls like a third of the time, he has a random Jack or something like that, or he's randomly got to the river with Ace Queen somehow, then I probably sh should just ship it. So. Yeah, but I think it's close. I, don't, I think it's closer than a lot of people would first think. Okay, I'm going to wrap up there. That session was probably not as enlightening as the one I played earlier, but I think there were still some cool spots, and I've tried to like talk about things in terms of my range and the way I'm approaching the game these days. So hopefully you're enjoying the start of this new series, um, and there'll be much more of the same, more live play, um, preceded by some analysis of a situation in general. And what I'm hoping is that by the end of the series, I should have opened that, given he's a massive nip. I've got the wrong tag there. Um, by the end of the series, we should have, we will have covered like a bunch of common situations and sort of done some theoretical work on how we should play in them, and we'll have built up like quite a good arsenal of standard lines and things like that. And when we go in game, that's when we talk about things in a bit on a bit more of a specific situation by situation basis. Um, and look at the look at spots where we can move away from that sort of foundation that we've built of how we play our range in the common spots. So questions or comments about this session or about the theory that came before, just leave them on the thread for me. And yeah, I'll see you guys. I wanted to bring up the cartoon just for one last to show it one last time, but it's not on my desktop anymore. So you guys will just have to remember and see it next time. So good luck at the tables. It's nice to be back doing live plays again for you guys, and I'll see you soon. Ciao for now.